Okay. Gotcha. Um, when you are using a CMS, a content management system, it's worth poking around to see what do they have, what have they, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a film um, that David Mamet wrote, and I think directed too, years ago, probably 20 years ago now, called Heist, and um, Gene, uh, I can't remember his name, he played Lex Luthor in um, Superman movies, but there's an actor who plays this character who's this con man, and somebody comes to him and goes, uh, there's a point to this, I promise. Somebody comes to him and goes, uh, you're a pretty smart guy, aren't you? And he says, I'm not really that smart a guy. I just think about what a smart guy would do, and then I do that. So I, th that's something I would say, if you're, if you're using a content management system, or if you haven't chosen one yet, but you know you want to use a content management system, it could be WordPress, it could be Drupal, it could be Omeka, uh, it could be any number of these, Look and see what you can find out about how accessible they are out of the box. Like somebody smart has already figured out a lot of these issues that you're going to have to deal with. So rather than reinvent the wheel, go find a tool that helps you be accessible from the start. Okay, and so that's something you can do with content management systems. It's also something you can do with, and I don't know what the requirements are for your assignment, but there are all kinds of templates that are out there for flat file HTML that are accessible from the start. You know, like if you start with somebody else's template that is accessible, if you find a, a library of templates that are accessible, um, that can go a long way toward helping you with, um, with your project. So the other way to answer that question, this is, I'm a professor, so we're long-winded. So another way to answer the question um, about how do I make sure that my projects are accessible, when I create materials for teaching, which is something I do, you know, every day of the academic year, I'm creating stuff. So I would, I would suggest to you to remember this mnemonic, this idea of, of slide, okay? That, um, and I got this from uh, my colleague who works in disability support services here, where he gives a presentation called Slide Into Accessibility. And SLIDE is an acronym for, the S stands for styles and headings, the L stands for links, the I stands for images, the D is design, and the E is empathy. So you slide into accessibility. So S, styles and headings. Um, think about when you are creating a document, whether it's in Microsoft Word or whether it's HTML, um, use headings and subheadings to delineate the different sections of a, of a given page. Okay, so the most important chunk of information on your page should be put inside an H1 tag. That's heading level one. And then the next thing needs to, they're not, it doesn't go in order, it goes in hierarchy of importance. So you should have one heading level one on the page, and then you can have heading level twos for the subsections, heading level threes for the sub subsections. And the reason that that helps with accessibility is because people, well, two things. One is people who use screen readers, you can tell the screen reader, don't read the whole page to me, just read the headings and the subheadings. And they jump from heading to heading like, like going through a table of contents. Um, number two, people who have cognitive disabilities like attention deficit disorder or, um, or things like that, headings and subheadings help them figure out what part of a particular page is about what it is they're looking for. Which is true for all of us, I think. I mean, frequently, you might be the most neurotypical person in the world, but if you're stressed, like I recently traveled um, to Canada for a week, and airports confuse me for whatever reason. I mean, I have a PhD. I'm, I like to think of myself a re as a reasonably smart guy, but I'm stressed when I travel because I'm worried about being late or what have you. And so, like, even people who are neurotypical are helped by those kinds of signposts of information, the headings and the subheadings. So always use headings and subheadings to chunk information into its different sections. Um, and then the third reason that using headings is important is search engines. The way that Google and other search, ins figure, search engines figure out what your site is about is they look at the headings. 
And so especially for those of you who are, um, if you're you know, in or going into library and information science, um, it's a discoverability issue. You know, that it's, stuff is easier to find when you use headings and subheadings. Don't just um, make typographical changes to stuff in order to make it into a heading. Because it's easy to take a, a text that's in your document, highlight it, make it bold, make it bigger, and say, there, I've made a heading. No, you haven't. You've just taken normal text and you've made it different. It's presented differently to users who are cited. To users who use a screen reader, it's, this, it's just normal text. They can't tell. To the search engine, it's just normal text. It cannot tell. That's why the style part is important. So um, in Microsoft Word, for example, you've got a style palette, and you, know, you can make something into a heading. You can make another thing into a heading level two. And then you go into the style palette, and you change what it looks like visually. Similarly with HTML, as I'm sure you're learning, you've got cascading style sheets. And the advantage of cascading style sheets is if you have a thousand page website, like all of your websites for this project are going to be a thousand pages, right? I'm sure they all are. So um, you don't want to have to go into, like somebody says, you know what, that's the wrong color for the heading. The heading shouldn't be blue, it should be purple. You don't want to have to go in and change every single heading. Instead, you go to the style sheet, you make that change once, and it, it affects every single page on your site. Um, so that's the, that's the S in... Trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm answering your question. I'm being long-winded at answering your question. So in terms of slide, that's an easy thing to do, um, is styles and, um, and headings. So use styles to control the presentation of information, but mark up the content of your information independent of what it's going to look like. And the other kind of exciting, not kind of, but the other exciting thing about styles is um, down the road, it's possible that, because you can have an audio style sheet. You can have a style sheet that, that says to whatever the machine is that accessing, that's accessing your stuff, it can, say to that, it can say to them, read this part in a woman's voice, read this part in a man's voice, read this part in a child's voice. You know, like st once you start to separate presentation from information, some really interesting things start to happen. So imagine what that might be like. And this is not something that's implemented right now that I know of. But imagine 50 years from now, maybe even 10 years from now, a play being marked up that way. Like you could listen to a play and all the different characters, their voices would sound different because there's an audio style sheet that does that. Um, but S, the S in slides, styles and headings are important. L, links. Make your links meaningful. Um, in other words, avoid the phenomenon of click here, right? So... Often you'll have a page where it'll say, you know, for more information about enrolling in this class, and that's regular text, and then there's a blue two-word two phrase, click here. And then the next sentence might be, if instead you're interested in learning about more classes that are being offered this semester, and then there's a two-word phrase, click here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not good because um, our eyes are drawn to the links. And if the links are nothing, so for people with cognitive disabilities and they're, they're scanning links, if all they see is click here, click here, click here, that's not helpful to them. Um, it also means that search engines aren't necessarily able to predict what different things are, so indexing of sites doesn't go as well. And then people who use screen readers, one of the things that they can do is they can have the screen reader read out loud to them all the links on a page. And if all the links say is click here, then they're going to hear 50 times in a row, click here, click here, click here, click here, and it's not going to be useful to them. So the S is styles and headings, the L is links. Make your links meaningful in some way. Like outside of the context in which they are originally presented, they should make sense. The I in slide stands for images. Um, how many of you have heard the phrase alt text before? All right, so that's maybe half of you. So alt, okay, that's a little more, that's half of you plus one. So alt text is alternative text for an image, meaning um, inside, you can do this in Microsoft Word, you can do this in PowerPoint, you can do this in HTML. It is the textual presentation of the information that's presented by the image. So you're, when you're doing visualization, like, you're, like um, Alicia is talking about, that can, be, that can be somewhat challenging, but I have some ideas about that a little bit, uh, for a little bit later. But when you've got images on your web page, 
there should be some kind of alternative text that makes the, the, somebody who can't see that image should know what that image contains. Um, so I'm looking at collegewomen.org, and I went to um, one of the uh, items in the, uh, I think it was Acad Athletics and Physical Education theme. And it's a photo from 1884 of the Mount Holyoke College baseball team. So there's an image. It's a photograph. It's a, it's a digital surrogate of a 19th century photograph. And there is a, um, all the metadata that's associated with it. There's a title, institution, description, subject, themes, date, format, copyright and use, original URL, and then how to cite this item. And this stuff is awesome because... One, I like to always say that metadata is accessibility waiting to be used. That metadata, the things that make people in digital humanities and in the humanities and in library and information science perfectly suited for accessibility projects is they're used to presenting a ton of information about what other people might see as a relatively simple artifact of some kind. But if you, you have to figure out how, what's the best way to present this information to my users so that they find this really useful. Um, I'm pretty sure, although I haven't looked at the source code and I'm not, I'm not that literate in, in looking at Drupal, I don't think there is an alt text value associated with this image, but the description is really pretty detailed, or the description component is a place where you can put in a lot of information. So what the description says is, a photograph of the Mount Holyoke baseball team of 1884. The photograph includes, and they list the names of all the people with, I think, their date of graduation, um, and they identify in parentheses who the captain is. Okay? What they don't tell you is three, four of the women are, are seated, um, five of them are standing, they're in the four, they're, in, they're on a hill somewhere, they're in a forest, um, they're holding what look like very, they don't look like what we would consider a baseball bat today. Um, it doesn't tell you that the photo looks kind of faded, that it's sepia toned. Like there's a lot of visual information that's part of the aesthetic experience of that image that isn't included in that description. And they may have made that choice because the image alternative text that you provide is going to depend upon what's the purpose of this photo. You know, what is it that you hope to convey by presenting this information to the user? Is it important to the user to know that these women are all wearing ankle-length dresses? Um, that, they're, that their helmets, they have, well, I can't tell if those are helmets or hats, actually. Um, but for, for Slide, um, the image, the thing to remember from Slide for the eye is alternative text for images. How do you present to the user in words what is contained in this image? And there's no easy way to answer that question, but it's, it's, it's based on what you want that image to convey to the user. Like there's a whole tradition of poetry devoted to this. It's, it's you know, the Greeks called it ekphrasis, where it's, you know, it's a poem that's about describing a visual uh, work of art in some way. Um, alt, alt text is your opportunity to I introduce that, that sort of skill into what it is that you're doing. So that's the I in slide. Um, D is design. So you've got styles and headings, links, make your links meaningful, you've got images, present textual information uh, that are equivalent to the image, uh, and then there's the D for design. Don't be afraid of white space. You know, don't cram a ton of information into what it is that you're doing. Um, make good choices about color. Um, you can, I'll talk about some tools that you can use to evaluate the accessibility of the stuff that you create, but one thing to be concerned about is um, people who are colorblind, uh, but also people who might have, might be low vision, who have difficulty um, distinguishing stuff where there's not high contrast between the foreground and the background. So there's kind of a cool design aesthetic that some people embrace, which is like charcoal on a dark gray background. Uh, it looks cool, but it's not very accessible because a lot of people have a hard time reading that information. Um, white space, you know, like you, if, if you have empty space and then you chunk pieces of information together on your page, that, that sends to the user, oh, these things belong together, these things belong together. It conveys, it conveys to them some, some logical connections among things. 
uh, your navigation elements. Make your navigation elements simple and predictable. Um, I learned just last week or the week before um, this, this principle. It's called the principle of least astonishment, uh, which I love. But the idea is that you don't want your user to be surprised by something. Like they have to figure out, wait a minute, what happened to that button at the top that always took me to the search page? Like, so your navigation should be simple and predictable. Um, and that's, you know, in, in terms of fonts, don't go, you know, don't go overboard on your font choices. You know, be relatively simple in terms of, you know, headings are one kind of font and body text is another kind of font. And it's, that, that should also be predictable. Um, and then the E is empathy. Uh, you know, think about from the point of view of different kinds of users that are out there. Think from their point of view. Don't just think, um, um, you know, that, oh, everybody, everybody accesses. Or, you know, a lot of times I think we're not even thinking it. It's, it's, it's an unexamined assumption. I'm looking at the web through my, through my um, laptop screen. That's what, how everybody experiences the web. Think in terms of like this is supposed to be something in the humanities we're good at doing. We're good at, at empathy, at, at trying to imagine another person's point of view. What would it be like if somebody only listened to the to the web? Or what would it be like if somebody couldn't see color? Um, what would it be like if somebody had a hard time um, reading complex, de you know, dense text, um, and there was no sort of key to understanding um, what some of these things meant? Maybe you should include a glossary, you know, for unfamiliar terms. Think about who your audience is. If you really, if you really want to embrace a kind of public humanities, open access um, format, if you really want to have an impact on the public broadly conceived, things like plain, simple language are going to go a long way. Things like a glossary of what will be unfamiliar terms for your audience will go a long way. And I think often... We are making choices, and this is not to say this is bad, but often we are making choices about design based on, well, what's, how is this going to make people think about me, right? I'm the creator. I want to be smart. I'm the writer. I want people to think I'm smart. But what that doesn't think about, what, what that means you're not thinking about is your audience. You know, who's using this, and, and are they finding this usable and helpful? So slide. That's a good mnemonic, one that I use when I try to think about the choices that I make as I create my own my own stuff from scratch. So those are two. Those, that's a very long, two-parted answer to your question. Um, one about like the the projects that I did that are scholarly projects, and one about just sort of in general as I'm creating resources for my students. Okay. Other questions. Other things that you have to to say or to ask. Yes. Blue shirt. I can hear you. I don't think that's possible. Um, I think there are always going to be edge case scenarios where, where somebody's having... Just, you know, I, I, I first learned HTML in 1996, and I know enough to know, and, and you know, you guys are, are significantly younger than me, but I'm, I'm sure that you've also found situations where the technology is not doing what it's supposed to do, whatever that might be. It could be your phone, it could be your laptop, it could be anything. It's like, I don't know why it's doing this. But you turn it off and you turn it back on again, and then suddenly it's working. Or, or you never get that problem solved. It just never, it never works the way it's supposed to. That's always going to be the case. Um, it, is it worth aspiring to 100%? Absolutely. But um, I, I just think we have to be flexible. I think we have to be open to, you know, I wrote this book chapter that, um, that's available online on, on universal design and digital humanities. And I was very gung-ho about the idea of universal design, that we can create things so that everybody can use them. They're usable by everybody. Um, and then since then, I've become much more, not critical of, but much more um, sort of hesitant about embracing uncritically that idea because I think it gives us a false sense of security. Um, well, I've created this so that everybody can use it. So if you're having a problem, that's clearly not my, my fault. Um, 
And so we have to be flexible. We have to be, we have to recognize that like digital standards can give us a false sense of security. If, if what's important is not the standards, what's important is people, right? I mean, what's important is I want the people that I'm creating this for to be able to use this. I want this to have an impact in some way in people's lives. And so I know from experience that you can make something a standard and somebody else still finds it confusing. And if that person or that, that category of people is important enough, then, you know, make some changes specifically for them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a good, I think, universal design. I think 100%, you know, we have no problems with accessibility. That's a good, that's a good goal. But I, I just, I don't think, I think that's less possible than having the mindset of I'm always willing to revisit what I'm doing and to make changes as necessary. Constant improvement if possible. Other thoughts, other questions? Yeah. I really think um, this is one of those areas that I think the data visualization is an area that pushes us to the limit of what we as sighted people are able to understand about how other people experience information. So years ago, I mean, I started, I really started embracing this stuff, accessibility in digital environments about eight years ago. And I, I, I created this online poll where I asked, I, and I, I would tweet about it, and I think I might have even sent it out to some listservs about what people's thoughts were about the importance of accessibility. And one, and almost everybody was always like, oh, of course it's important. Yes, this is something that we all need to, you know, we all need to be concerned with, which is great, but didn't really give me anything to push back against or like, you know, if, if we all think this is important, why aren't we all doing it already? But one person said, well, not everything can be made accessible because, you know, think about data visualization. How, 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 should, how can we worry about making that accessible to somebody with, you know, who can't see? And I thought, well, this is, and at the time I immediately thought, this is a person who's mistaking the map for the territory. That what's important about data visualization isn't the visualization part. It's the data part. Like visualization is the means by which we make sense of a huge amount of information in an easily processed way, right? That's the goal behind digital data visualization. You've got a, maybe a, you know a hundred thousand points of information, or you think about the way that um, our la you know our presidential election in 2016, all the different visualizations that have come out about that. Um, the goal there is not I need to make a really cool visual. The goal there is I need to understand the patterns that are inherent in these, how many people was it? Like 120, 130 million people voted. Um, I need to understand the patterns in these millions of unique bits of information. Visualization is just one way to do it. So what would an oralization be like, right? I mean, somebody who hears information what would that be like if there were no visual component? I can't even imagine that myself. I know there are people who are doing, I, I, I've heard there are people who are doing experimentation on things like this. Um, this is also one of those areas where I think people with cognitive disabilities might, might find, if, if we're not taking their needs into account, they could really struggle with this. Um, so uh, the thing that I would say about, you know, I, I don't have a nice like five point, uh, five point advice to give you, here's what you need to do if you wanna make your visualizations accessible. Instead it would just be, um, this is really like at the outermost, I think, boundary of what we know about making stuff accessible. But it's useful for thinking about, oh yeah, uh, why are we using vision as the means to understand this stuff? I can tell you that there, um, there is a thing called tactile graphics. Uh, if you have a maker space on campus that has a 3D printer, 
you could come up with some, and it wouldn't, it, I don't think it would be interactive though. In fact, I know it wouldn't be. But you can create tactile graphics using um, 3D printers. There are, other, there are other dedicated tools for creating things like that, but one thing that 3D printers can do is create tactile, tactile graphics so that a user feels a map or they feel um, a graph with bars on it or something like that. Uh, you can do some really sophisticated things. Um, and I know that places like MIT and Michigan um, and maybe Stanford are experimenting with some hardware that's like, um, you know, imagine a 12 by 12 space uh, that you can touch that, that, it, that is interactive, that goes up and down, you know, underneath with these little pins. Um, but those things are, are those, that's, that's pretty experimental and pretty out there on the edge and, and kind of expensive from what I understand. But those are things where I think the digital humanities and digital um, studies can contribute to and not just learn from accessibility um, by, by coming up with, I mean, you guys could be working on, you guys, that's a ter terrible, like, I'm, I'm addressing a female-only audience, a woman-only audience of you guys. So you women could be coming up with some of these solutions for presenting information in, in, in what, like the same thing that visualization is designed to do without using vision, with, that, with coming up with something else. On the other hand, I know there have to be guidelines out there for what can I do with my visualization to make it more accessible. Um, one thing that I would say, and then I'll shut up, is color. Um, be mindful of color. Um, make sure that the contrast among your colors is high enough that it passes the, the standard and um, and, and can the, somebody who's colorblind or, or has low vision, you know, has difficulty distinguishing color, can make sense of it. Um, so, I'll I will share with Alicia um, a page with some links to stuff for y'all to make use of, and hopefully that will be helpful to you. Other questions? Other thoughts? Yes. I think um, I think one of the I would answer that in two ways. I think one is I would just reiterate what we were just talking about that when we start to do all this stuff with visualization that is really exciting, especially the interactive visualizations, um, that that represents a real a great opportunity for being able to understand vast amounts of information quickly. But, I, but we don't necessarily know how to make that fully accessible. Like, there's a limit on what we know how to do. And what's, what's frustrating about that is it's a limit on what we know how to do. What's exciting about that is it represents a possibility to try to figure something new out. So people who like puzzles, people who like solving problems, um, people who like experimenting with uncharted territory, that's a great opportunity for trying to, trying to think about those things. Like, what might we do here that would be different? So that's one. Um, another one is people with cognitive disabilities, I think. Um, if, if somebody is significantly developmentally delayed, is it, is it really possible to make everything accessible and understandable to that person? Um, how do you do that? You know, if you had, if you had um, a classroom full of young adults with Down syndrome and you were reading, or if you had a classroom full of young adults and half of them had Down syndrome and half of them were, you know, um, people who did, were not identified as having a disability, could they have the same experience of like a class on American postmodernism in, in short stories? Um, how would you make that accessible to them? Um, I don't know, like, you know, I, I'm trying to think about, you know, situations that would be sort of edge cases where you just have to say, 
this is not for absolutely everyone. I think that, you know, I, I tend to embrace that as an ideal without, I, you ask a very good question. I tend to embrace that as an ideal without acknowledging and being patient enough with what are the potential limits to what I'm doing here. Um, I think that if, if you have, this is where I th another, another way to, to sort of rethink universal design um, if you know that your audience is, is, is very specific, or at least is you know, specific enough, um, then you don't have to worry about the needs of people who are outside of that audience. Um, and I'm trying to think of a good specific example. Um, I don't know. Can you all think of an example of a project that you might be working on where you are... How about we try this? I'm going to try this, which I've never done before in a Skype console. So there's, this, there's a pedagogical method called think-pair-share. All right? So let's try this. I want you to take out something to write with or, or put your hands on your keyboard, whatever works for you. And I want you to take two minutes and write down your thoughts on this. What is a scenario that you can imagine in which you are creating a digital resource for a fairly limited audience and you want to focus on that audience's needs and you don't have to worry about like everybody possible? You, that you don't have to think universally, you have to think specifically about that particular audience, a digital project for a specific, narrow, defined audience. Take two minutes. Don't think about it too much, just write down what that is. You're about halfway through two minutes.